Thanks again for joining us. And I will now hand it over to Interim Commissioner Jonathan J. Smith to start the program. Thank you, Cicely. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon as we celebrate Fair Housing Month and we commemorate the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act in 1968. You know, all forms of discrimination are wrong and pernicious, but there is something deeply troubling about discrimination in the housing context, because as many of us know, where we live often influences critical aspects of our life, where our children go to school, the type of healthcare we have access to, the type of supermarkets we can go to, access to public transportation, and even the type of job that we can get. When the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, just days after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there was great hope that the, scar the scourge of housing discrimination would finally be ended. And yet here we are 53 years later. And while we can say that there's been progress on some fronts, there's far more work that we need to do, particularly as it pertains to racial discrimination. You know, at the federal level, our partners at the US Department of Housing and, Develop and Urban Development have set a theme for this month, more than just words. And that underscores the commitment from the new Biden administration on addressing long-standing issues of inequity in housing. And I'm thrilled that in a few minutes, we're going to hear from a friend and colleague at HUD about what the federal government is doing to tackle housing discrimination. But before getting there, I wanted to start a bit closer to home because here in New York State, we also share that commitment to making the promise of fair housing real for all New Yorkers, regardless of who they are, what they look like, what their lawful source of income may be. And we know that there's still far more work that we have to do to make sure that promise is realized for all New Yorkers. And so we're gonna talk later on the program about the efforts that we have taken and the efforts that we are committed to taking here at the Division of Human Rights and with our colleagues both in and outside of government to make that promise real. But before getting to that, I wanted to start by um, having a conversation with um, a number of experts on the issue of housing discrimination. And so I'm thrilled to be joined um, for this first part of our program by three people who have been fighting the fight for fair housing for quite some time and who are acutely aware of both the, the problems that we still need to tackle in this area, as well as some of the accomplishments we've made to date. Their full bios will be made available in the chat, but very briefly, I wanted to introduce our, three, our first three panelists. First, Elaine Gross, who is the founder and president of Erase Racism. Aaron Carr, who is the founder and executive director of the Housing Rights Initiative, and Alejandro Ortiz, who is a senior staff attorney with the mm -hmm. ACLU Racial Justice Project. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for this important and timely discussion. Elaine, I was hoping I could start with you. Back in November 2019, which seems like a very long time ago because of the pandemic, but it's perhaps not that long ago. We all remember that Newsday published an explosive expose on housing discrimination on Long Island. And for those of you not familiar, the sum and substance of that reporting was that Newsday used undercover testers who found that people of color are far more likely to face discrimination when looking for a new home as compared to their white counterparts. I know that your organization, Erase Racism, has been working to address racial bias on Long Island since 2001. And so I'm curious, given this kind of long vantage point that you have, what impacts, if any, do you think the Newsday investigation has had 
on the issue of housing discrimination on Long Island and what more work still needs to be done. Sure. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm pleased to be with you today. So um, we're very aware of the Newsday investigation. Actually, the publisher, Mr. Dolan, contacted us after we had a lawsuit, a couple of lawsuits related to rental housing and asked, what, what can we do? And my suggestion was, well, you can do testing <laughs> because they have a lot more resources than we have. And so the biggest impact is we, those of us in the nonprofit community, um, are no longer talking about this case and that case. But Newsday was able to do their investigation all across the island and also with um, uh, for different um, uh, price ranges for the homes. And so it gives a level of credibility that was just hard to muster um, from uh, individualized cases. The other thing that's happened though, which is not the good news, is that um, you know we're hearing anecdotally that some of the real estate agents are doubling down. So it's like, you know, are oh, you going to come after me? You know, that kind of thing. And uh, so they're going to find other ways to continue what they're doing, uh, what they have been doing all along, which is discriminating. At the same time, we've had several companies contact us and they really do want to do the right thing. So I don't have, we don't have an in-depth research on this or, or anything, but I just think it is helpful that um, there are some folks that are, have made a change in their business model, so to speak, um, while we know that we are going to need very aggressive enforcement because it appears that some of the agents don't intend to change and actually they see it as good for their business because people who wanted to discriminate now they know okay agent a over there that's where i'm going to go because they basically want to discriminate so it is a complex uh problem and i do believe that on the whole we are going to have so much good come out of what Newsday uh, has done. And we've already seen from the New York State Senate, and I won't go into that, someone else is going to talk about it. But um, we, um, I was an expert witness for both of those hearings. And I was just so impressed with the seriousness of the senators in understanding and and pressing the realtors when they finally got them in front of them uh, via a uh, subpoena, uh, pressing them on the issue. So I can't say enough about Newsday's investigation and how it is changing um, what everyone is talking about and the face of what fair housing is gonna look like uh, in the future. So thank you, Elaine. And I mean, I think a point you made, a number of points you made are really valid. I mean, I think it's important to note, and I'm sure you and, and you know others here, you know, we're not probably surprised by the findings, right? Because anyone, you know, I've often said, you know, I grew up, my family grew up on Long Island. And so um, I'm intimately aware of what this type of discrimination looks like. And I'm sure many other people of color. Um, can have, have a similar experience from that region. However, what I think is notable is the amount of attention that um, this um, reporting has really, um, the, the spotlight is placed on this issue. Mm -hmm. And I think what we've seen, you know, I think again, the George Floyd protests are another example in a different context is that, you know, sometimes you have these spotlights on these issues. Um, there is a possibility to have 
um, this broader conversation and broader attention about reform, um, which I think we've seen in New York State um, on a variety of levels, as you mentioned. I mean, I do, if we have time, want to circle back to one of the points you made about kind of how the, the discrimination has continued to morph and evolve. Because again, you know, I think one thing that we've seen you know, throughout um, this country's history is that that, tip, that tends to happen, right? When you have moments of progress, you do see a step forward, but you also see discrimination continuing to kind of shape shift into different formats. And it's important to, to keep up with that. Um, but before getting there, I wanted if, uh, to turn maybe in a moment to you, Erin, um, because I know that you and your organization has been focused a lot on um, another form of housing discrimination that we have seen a lot of discussion about in New York State recently, and that's discrimination based on lawful source of income. And, and very briefly, for those who may not be aware, um, um, in, in parts of the state and now across New York State due to legislation that was passed in 2019, it's unlawful for a landlord or a, 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 a housing provider to discriminate against a New Yorker for their lawful source of income, which could be a voucher, you know, a Section 8 voucher is one example people may be most familiar with, but there are other governmental funding programs or other funding programs that exist that provide um, support for people to secure housing. And right now under New York state law, it's, it's, it's discriminatory to deny someone an apartment because they have section eight or they have another form of, of, of governmental assistance. And so I know that your organization has been tracking the issue of source of income, particularly in New York City, um, and actually recently uh, filed litigation um, challenging that practice. And so could you talk a bit about um, what that, um, you know, kind of what your organization has seen about source of income and, and what you're hoping to accomplish in your new litigation. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, our organization has been uh, focusing on, on source of income discrimination, because as we know, uh, source of income discrimination, right, is where rental assistance goes to die. And I don't mean that in a, in a figurative way. I mean that in a literal way, because as we know, uh, tenants with housing choice vouchers only have a certain amount of time to find an apartment, right, before their voucher expires. And when a voucher expires, uh, in many cases, due to discrimination, uh, landlords just point blank refusing to rent to voucher holders, uh, the recipient eventually loses their voucher and an opportunity to lower their rent share to 30% of their income, uh, which is the entire purpose of the voucher program. So now that family with an expired voucher is at the complete whims of the market and pays on average 60% of their income on rent. And now that family has less money for food, right? Less money for healthcare, less money for transit, less money for surviving, and most importantly, less money for living. It's very hard to live when you're paying 70% of your income on rent. So source of income discrimination, right, is more than just a housing issue. It's, a, it's an everything issue that really touches upon every single facet of a family's life. So we feel that combating this uh, pernicious and pervasive problem is just a great way of, of lifting people out of poverty and lifting people out of housing security. So that is why, uh, as an organization, we are absolutely obsessed with this issue. Uh, and I think there's just an incredible opportunity to do some good here. Uh, with regards to our recent efforts, uh, our organization recently filed a federal lawsuit against 88 uh, real estate companies for violating city, state, and federal fair housing laws. And this was based on a uh, year-long effort uh, into um, a year-long investigation into the New York City real estate sector. And as we know, uh, in New York State, it is illegal for landlords to discriminate against tenants with a uh, source of income. But nonetheless, we have received just a litany of complaints over the years uh, alleging housing discrimination. So to combat this problem, our organization launched uh, an undercover investigation to catch real estate companies engaging in these mass civil rights uh, violations. Uh, so we trained and we equipped and we deployed investigators who covertly recorded hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds, I almost want to say thousands, but hundreds upon hundreds of phone calls uh, posing as prospective tenants with Section 8 vouchers uh, in order to determine if these brokers and landlords would accept the vouchers as they are required uh, to do so by law. So this wasn't a complex investigation. 
it was a widespread investigation that didn't confine itself to just a few real estate companies, uh, but an entire real estate sector. Because uh, we believe that systematic problems right, require systematic solutions. So we wanted just to call every single company uh, in New York City that was listing their apartments on StreetEasy to see if they were following the laws. And what we found is that in nearly half of all cases, uh, real estate professionals uh, were illegally discriminating against their undercover investigators. And to make matters worse, the discrimination was most prevalent in higher income neighborhoods, which is not good because New York City is deeply segregated, right, economically and racially. So in light of these findings, we filed a federal lawsuit against 88 companies. Uh, and outside of the litigation itself, our hope is, is that this investigation will, will bring attention right, to this pervasive and pernicious issue of housing discrimination uh, and will result in more support and more funding uh, for our uh, fair housing agencies and our fair housing organizations at a city, state, and federal level. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, there's, not, there's no one entity that will be able to solve this problem on their own. Uh, it's really a community affair. Oh, I think you're thank you for that. <laughs> thank oh, you're welcome. You for your, thank you for the work that, that you and your colleagues have done around this issue. And I do, you know, again, I think what you know made a number of really good points. I did, you know, I think one of the points you made, which I think is similar to a point that Elaine made, um, and I think you know, it really speaks to this kind of issue of kind of you're know, almost like whack-a-mole. I think that you often feel like you're playing with discrimination, right? Where you like take one problem over here, then you see another problem over there. <laughs> and I, I do want to return to that because I, I, you know, it's not limited to housing discrimination, but I think it's particularly difficult to combat in the housing sector because of the nature of just how housing works. Um, but before getting there, I wanted to bring Alejandro into the conversation and, um, Alejandro, I mean, you have you know, been working at the ACLU Racial Justice Project for a long time, um, and I know that you know, you've been doing a lot of really important work around fair housing as well. And you know, I think um, you know one of the issues you know I think we often hear um, when it comes to housing discrimination, fair housing, is that you know it's not really about discrimination; it's about you know making sure the communities are safe or secure, or, you know, kind of making sure that we all have a nice, safe, and protective place to live in. Um, and so I know that you've been involved in litigation in Minnesota and maybe elsewhere, kind of looking at how local government and other actors have kind of used the pretext or the proxy of security or stability uh, as a way to um, really um, further discrimination. So I wonder if you could talk about that, because I, again, I, I do think it's also related to this whole kind of whack-a-mole issue of what discrimination looks like in the in this sector. Thank you, Commissioner, and good afternoon to you all. Before getting into that, I'd like to flag a uh, response to uh, what you and Elaine were talking about regarding the investigation out of Long Island and certain realtors doubling down on their potentially illegal steering practices. That is, you know, steering racial minorities away from uh, communities that the realtors would not like them to live in. Um, to the extent there's doubling down going on, I would just flag that the Fair Housing Act provides for punitive damages um, in instances where defendants are disregarding federally protected rights, and there's evidence to support that. So I wouldn't be shy about uh, informing realtors of that fact. That's been very useful in the lawsuit that I'll talk about in a minute that we've been engaging in, in terms of leverage that the, the defendant in the lawsuit that I'll talk about in a minute didn't, wasn't aware that, that under the Fair Housing Act, they may be exposed to punitive damages in addition to compensatory damages and damages under for emotional distress. So yeah, the one issue that I want to flag and that I've been working primarily on at the racial justice program at the ACLU is the, the scourge of so-called crime-free housing programs, which are, there's about 2,000 of these programs across the country, I think in 48 or 50 states. And these programs, uh, they vary in form. Sometimes some are voluntary, some are mandatory, uh, but the basic gist is they uh, impose an obligation on private landlords to either evict existing tenants if in the police department's eyes those tenants or guests of those tenants are engaged in undefined often disorderly conduct warranting in the police's eyes eviction uh, or these programs require 
that the private landlords run criminal background checks on prospective tenants, applicants for rental housing, and bar or otherwise consider discriminating or barring applicants that have a criminal record. And to the extent there's any discrimination uh, it, it, on the basis of criminal records, that's going to fall hardest on uh, Black and Latino communities, given the disproportionate rates at which they are charged and convicted of crimes all across this country. So the problem with these programs, or one of the problems with the programs, is it imports the racial bias inherent in the criminal legal system, uh, decisions to charge by the police, decisions to prosecute by prosecutors, exposure to underfunded public defenders, uh, and the sort of uh, the, the fact that you know, many defendants plea bargain, not realize what this conviction can later lead to. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this particular lawsuit that I wanna highlight, uh, which is a lawsuit that uh, we brought against this community uh, named Faribault. It's a small city in Minnesota, about an hour south of Minneapolis. They had a, a program that we challenged under the Fair Housing Act. It's a, a crime-free housing program. And the, the basis for the liability is uh, under the Fair Housing Act, you have, uh, you can allege intentional discrimination. That is along the lines of what was Elaine and you all, you were talking about in terms of intentionally uh, discriminating against communities of color. Uh, but one of the theories that we're bringing is a race neutral policy. That is a crime-free housing program or other such policy that discriminates in this case on the basis of criminal records can still have a disparate impact on communities of color, given the, the rates that they are, uh, what is happening uh, in, in another context, in this case, in the criminal justice system. And so we brought a lawsuit challenging the crime-free housing program as discriminatory under the disparate impact theory under the Fair Housing Act. And uh, we've gotten pretty far, but it, it highlights, we were hoping to use this particular lawsuit as leverage to, uh, to help rid the country of these so-called crime-free housing programs. Getting back to your question, Commissioner, uh, the city's defense to this program is, yes, this may discriminate uh, against black and brown communities. It may fall hardest on them. However, you gotta look at our interests here. We have an interest in reducing crime and this program reduces crime. That's their defense. However, the evidence has not supported that defense. Uh, crimes have been, had been going down for years before they enacted this program. And you know, we used FBI and other criminal data to show that there was no correlation between uh, the enactment of this so-called crime reducing program and any reduction in crime whatsoever. So the, the chief justification for the program uh, didn't hold water. Uh, and so uh, in our uh, theory that the same uh, problem exists in all these programs, that there is no uh, clean relationship between a person's criminal record, or in some instances, arrest, and arrest alone can be the basis for uh, a decision not to allow someone to, to live in a house, in a, in, in a rental dwelling. You know, an arrest that didn't even lead to a conviction, that itself could be used. So there's no correlation between discriminating on the basis of these broad-based criminal records and any reduction in crime whatsoever. So uh, so that's one issue that I want to highlight uh, and, 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 and sort of as well as to flag that this is a program that exists throughout the country. So I'll leave it at that unless you have any, any follow-up questions. Thank you for that. And you know, I think you also touched on a number of important topics. Um, I, I, I hope we do have time to circle back uh, you know, to the broader conversation about disparate impact because um, you know, that is a policy that is critically important to combating um, discrimination in all spaces, but particularly housing. It's also a policy where we saw um, you, you may have whiplash if you looked at how that policy was interpreted under the Trump administration versus how it's you know, being interpreted under the Biden administration and previously under the Obama administration before that. And so I think that's an important conversation uh, to get back to it. Certainly we at the Division of Human Rights, you know, we have um, a disparate impact case that we've been litigating on Long Island against the town of Oyster Bay and some others. And so, yes, yeah, so it's been a really critically important tool. Um, I did want to um, kind of, um, um, to, you know, kind of fire off some kind of maybe rapid answer questions for all of you. Um, and I will also just note to the audience, um, if you have questions, please, um, put them in the 
question and answer the Q&A function. And then we're going to try to um, get through as many of those questions as possible. Um, but I wanted to kind of go back to this issue of you know, kind of whack-a-mole discrimination. Maybe start with you, Elaine, but you know, Aaron or Alejandra, if you want to jump in here too, please do. So, you know, one of the things we often hear um, when it comes to housing discrimination, I think this is probably true in the rental um, situation, like in source of income, but also the, the home buying situation is that, you know, a realtor might say, well, I'm not discriminating here. You know, it's my client, right? They're the ones who want to live in a all white community or all black community, or, you know, they want to you know, they want good schools and, you know, is it my fault if all the good schools uh, tend to be in places that are all one race and not the other? Um, or, you know, you might hear people say that, well, the reason why I don't want Section 8, uh, you know, recipients is because I have to get the money from the government and there are delays and there are issues with repairs and, you know, it's just a hassle and I just don't want to deal with that. I'd rather just have um, a tenant who just pays me directly. Um, and so I wonder, you know, kind of when you hear those types of justifications, um, I mean, the short answer is, do you buy them? I mean, I suspect the answer is no, but, but, but I, I, will, I will turn to you all to see um, kind of, you know, what are the responses to those types of, of issues that come up in this context? Sure. So no, we don't buy them. And yes, they do make them. Uh, they make all kinds of claims. Uh, the realtors will say that the people who are hiring them don't want to make a problem for their neighbors. And, you know, these people have become their friends and they wouldn't want to stick them with these other folks, non-white people coming into the community. So I think there are two, two ways to go about this. Um, Personally, I don't go down the rabbit hole of trying to, uh, in some kind of logical fashion, answer all of their, all of these outrageous things that they say. Um, I think that we need to take into account that fair housing is not about any one transaction, just one transaction. It has, a, it, it, it has a contextual framework. And so part of what we're doing is taking into account what has come before. And so when municipalities, for example, say, well, we're just trying to help the people who already live here gain access to affordable housing. And that's why we have these, uh, these policies these geographic preference policies. Well, you know, we have to say, let me tell you something. You've been very successful at keeping people of color out of your com community for all of these years. You, and so your so-called race neutral policy, uh, as was being explained, it, it, it has a disparate impact in terms of keeping out uh, people of color. And on Long Island, we have it's an unresolved case, but the Department of Justice did go after the town of Oyster Bay for such a policy, a town that has at the time 3% African Americans and only 1% of those were income eligible. So essentially without saying blacks need not apply, that's what the policy was doing. So I think that we shouldn't be swayed by all of the many excuses that people will come up with. Um, we tried to do some research in response to one of those things where they said, well, black people don't want to live. They only want to live with other black people. It's expensive. We hired a survey research firm and they found, guess what? That was not true. Only 1% of the respondents said they only wanted to live with other black people. Uh, but I think that, you know, they'll keep us circling, uh, chasing our tails with all of these things. We have to just be very clear, the law is the law. And there is a lot of justification for whether it's source of income uh, or any of the other protections that we're talking about. And so 
They just have to get over it and obey the law. And uh, otherwise, we'll drive ourselves crazy. Oh, they said this. Let's see if we can find some way to prove to them that that is no. <laughs> Aaron, did you want to jump in here? Yeah, I mean, I'll just, I 100% agree with what was just said. Um, if, a, if real estate wants, these are two, like, two separate issues. If real estate wants to fight, for example, for faster inspections, they should fight for faster inspections. That is a separate issue. You can't say, you know, because the inspections, and, and by the way, there's, you know, the inspections are, are, it depends on which area, but they're usually quick enough. If a, if a real estate company has a problem with that, they should, they should fight to reform that part of the system. That's not an excuse to commit mass civil rights violations. That's not an excuse to break local, uh, state, and federal fair housing laws, right? And it's also important to understand that most landlords that take Section 8 or sorry, take voucher or accept uh, vouchers um, are happy with the voucher program. There was, a, there was a recent study, I think a survey by the, I think it was the Urban Institute that found it was something like 75% of black landlords, uh, about 70% of white landlords, and it was like 75 or 80% of Hispanic landlords have positive experiences with voucher holders. So a lot of times it's just a few that are making a big stink about this because they got caught committing mass civil rights violations and they don't want to say, you know, I'm a bad company. So they try to look outward. As was just said, the law is the law. If you can't follow the law, then maybe you shouldn't be in real estate. If you can follow the law, then okay. <laughs> you know, uh, I, think, I think we could work with you. But I think those are two separate things. If someone has a list of reforms that they want to make, they should fight for that. That's not an excuse to uh, illegally discriminate against tenants with uh, Section 8 and uh, just vouchers in general. Yeah, I mean, to that to that last point, you know, I mean, I've, you know, one really good thing about a program like Section 8 from a landlord perspective is that, you know, you know, the government's going to pay their share, right, that, you know, you don't have to worry about, I can't find my tenant, right, when your when your tenant or at least part of your tenant's, you know, kind of income is coming, you know, from the government. And so to your point about the reliability of the program and the reliability of that, of that rental income, that should be a boon for a landlord to not have to kind of worry about um, that, which is you know, obviously a case for many other tenants. Um, and, and that same survey showed that one third of landlords who accept vouchers reported that um, uh, the pandemic has made it more likely for them to accept vouchers in the future. So that speaks to your point. I think now there's like an awakening where it's like, oh my God, right? That, you know, we're in a pandemic. A lot of people have lost their jobs. We want steady revenue to come in. And what's steadier revenue than, you know, the, a voucher program that guarantees on average 70% of the rent. Great. So uh, Alejandro, if I can, I want to circle back to you just on this issue of disparate impacts. I know Elaine, you brought it up. Um, and, and again, I think, you know, actually disparate impact is often, um, you know, kind of underlying a lot of the discrimination that's also kind of playing out, you know, in some context in a section, in a, in a source of income context as well, in terms of, you know, disproportionate communities who are often burdened by these policies. And so, as I mentioned, you know, under the Trump administration, to give a very kind of quick capstone of this, you know, we saw um, the federal government retreat from disparate impact um, in the housing context and even tried to undo um, rules and regulations that had been put into place to make uh, that protection stronger based on, you know, um, a decision from the US Supreme Court making clear that disparate impact is not only a valid, um, form of combating housing discrimination, but in fact, um, it is, you know, it could be a really useful tool in doing that. And so I, you know, I, I was wondering if you could speak to the work that you, the ACLU did to kind of combat, um, you know, what the Trump administration attempted to do and what are your kind of hopes or maybe promises um, for disparate impact under this new Biden administration? Sure. Uh, before getting into that, I wanted to address one of the questions that was flagged in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, one of the questions had to, was by Denise. Realtors put it on landlords, stating that the landlord doesn't want the vouchers due to some of them saying they take their time providing the voucher in a timely manner. That question flagged or raised for me the idea that uh, in some certain cer some circumstances, the bad actor in a fair housing situation will put the onus on a landlord. So in in the Faribault case that I mentioned before, uh, we are suing the city of Faribault for this law, this ordinance that it enacted. One of its defenses is look to the landlords. They're the ones who are screening applicants and making decisions whether to 
uh, bar housing or not. It's not us. We just require that they run a criminal background check. We have no say on whether they act on the results of that check. And one thing to just point out to this audience is the Fair Housing Act provides for vicarious liability. So we you know, successfully uh, defeated that defense and said, no, you're the ones who are requiring that landlords undertake this uh, program and increasing the opportunities for discriminating uh, against communities of color based on this criminal background check. So that's something to keep in mind that in some circumstances, uh, a, uh, a realtor may not be able to just say, look to the landlord, they're the ones doing decision X, Y, and Z. If the, if the, if the realtor is sort of imposing that on the uh, landlord, then that may be grounds for liability under the Fair Housing Act to the realtor, uh, him or herself. Uh, as to the question of you know, disparate impact liability, yeah, it is, uh, it is central to uh, our lawsuit and a really useful, as you mentioned, tool to combat not only sort of unconscious forms of racial bias, but also these race, race neutral policies that fall hardest, such as a crime free housing program uh, on communities of color. And what's really useful from, uh, uh, from our perspective is it's not just a matter of for liability purposes for the plaintiffs to say, look, this race neutral policy has a disparate impact, we win. That's not the end of the inquiry under established disparate impact law as, as I understand it under, you know, as the courts have interpreted that law, but rather uh, the defendant has an opportunity to say, okay, well, there may be an impact there, but it's, it's necessary, this particular policy to serve a legitimate interest. So in the Faribault case, we need it as a crime reducer, right? We need this crime uh, free program as a crime reducer. Uh, and then it was our bird at the plaintiffs to so, no, hold on a second. You don't because it's not actually reducing crime. And look, to the extent you have any legitimate interest, and this goes to the third step in this burden shifting test under disparate impact liability, here's another policy that you could have in place that could serve the same uh, interest. For example, a more nuanced version of a crime-free housing program where you have a limited look back period, or you only consider felonies as opposed to misdemeanors or convictions as opposed to arrest. So there's ways for a good faith defendant to uh, respond to a disparate impact claim. It's not just, you know, disparate impact alone will lead to liability. They have some ways to defend against it if there's a good faith effort, uh, a good faith reason for having a race neutral policy that hits hardest on communities of color. So yes, yeah, so under uh, under HUD, HUD had enacted a disparate impact rule in 2013 that has been that serves as guidance for federal courts, uh, and federal courts have then sort of you know incorporate that rule. And in many instances, they did so in the Eighth Circuit where I'm prosecuting this Faribault case. The the Trump administration and that disparate impact rule has those three steps that I mentioned. Uh, that was uh, repealed by by Trump uh, with a new uh, more onerous to plaintiffs disparate impact rule that has been. Uh, thankfully uh, held up in litigation where there was a, uh, and I'm not sure the status as of today, but I know a Massachusetts court, federal court issued a nationwide injunction uh, enjoining the use of that disparate impact rule as a violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. That is that the Trump administration didn't undertake all the necessary steps uh, in promulgating that new more restrictive rule. So at this point, you know, I've been, we've been ignoring sort of what's going on in administrations. Thankfully we could because it was enjoined and just focus on established case law, interpreting the Fair Housing Act itself uh, in light of the case that you mentioned or alluded to, Commissioner, the 2015 uh, Inclusive Communities case out of the Supreme Court that established that certain language in the Fair Housing Act is a, a basis for disparate impact liability. So yeah, disparate impact is a, a very useful tool to get at or you know, instances where where uh, decision makers aren't overtly making decisions on the basis of race, yet their decisions are harming people uh, on the basis of race. I don't know if that, that completely answers your question or if I miss some aspect of it. No, that's really helpful. And, and again, I think, you know, now that you know, obviously there's a new administration, um, you know, I think the expectation and I think the president and the HUD secretary have made clear this, you know, um, they don't intend to continue uh, to advance the Trump um, era disparate impact rule, but, you know, I think everyone's expectation based on their you know, public positions is that a return to that um, 
prior um, you know, 2013 rule, which you, as you mentioned, is also kind of fully consistent with how federal courts have been interpreted disparate impact you know, for, for, for decades um, in, in this context. Um, I did, you know, there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A and I want to see if we can maybe do like a, a quick round of trying to answer some of them. So um, I will try to um, run through them. And some of them I think are specific to some of you. So Aaron, maybe starting with you, you know, one question was, what if uh, there's an um, apartment that, you know, costs more than what the, the voucher is? Um, you know, how does that work from a, from a source of income um, kind of legal perspective? Oh, yeah, well, then that, then that apartment wouldn't be, um, wouldn't be eligible uh, if it's over, right, the, the maximum amount that a tenant could spend on rent. So that would be, that would be a different equation. And when we tested landlords uh, and brokers, we took that into account. We were only calling apartments that, are, that would be eligible to a potential Section 8 tenant. So we weren't calling like luxury units, right? For, you know, or, or uh, brokers that were trying to rent out luxury units at $5,000 a month, that would not be eligible for the Section 8 program. So, um, so that's, that's a different equation. Uh, and yeah, the most important thing to know is that landlords, they just, they can't say no to Section 8 tenants, right? That's not a no answer, right? If this apartment is not eligible, but we also have to be careful here because sometimes you know, as our um, investigation shows, landlords or brokers may lie and say that this apartment is not eligible for the Section 8 program when it actually is. So it's very important for tenants to have this information, Section 8 tenants or, or tenants with rental assistance, to have this information beforehand, because sometimes brokers and landlords will, you know, give misinformation. Uh, and it's important to, to, uh, to, to figure that out. Thank you. Elaine, um, you know, I think a number of the questions um, um, have reflected on, you know, what can um, a person do? Say I am a home buyer on Long Island and, you know, I think I'm being racially steered or I think, you know, um, my broker, my agent's not showing me um, the full range. You know, are there, um, are there tips or resources that are available? And, you know, one also, I think, link of this question is, you know, and, you know, and I know this because my wife and I were currently in the home buying market and it's, you know, it's, it's a crazy market out there, right? And so what additional challenges does that pose in an environment when, you know, all these transactions may be happening a lot quicker than you might, you know, traditionally expect that you spend weeks or months looking for a house that you do an inspection and, you know, you know, we now are seeing that's taking place in the course of a week or a weekend or a day. So does that pose additional challenges in the context of trying to ferret out some of these discriminatory ac actions? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I saw some of those questions as well in the chat and people were saying, well, what does it look like and how do I know if I'm being discriminated against? And going back to your very first question, Commissioner, about the Newsday investigation, please do go to newsday.com. If you're not a subscriber, you can still access the Long Island Divided uh, investigation on the website and watch the videos that will give you examples of some of the things that happen. That doesn't mean that a person who is a potential victim is going to realize that they've been victimized because that's something we have said over and over again. And it's the reason why we need testing is because you don't know what the realtor has done with a white person. You don't know that there were different rules for you, a person of color, versus the white person who was asking to purchase or to rent. Um, but if you do suspect, make a few phone calls. There are on Long Island, you can call the Long Island Housing Services. You can call the two human rights commissions. Uh, you could certainly uh, follow up with the New York State Division of Human Rights. Um, and um, you, can, um, you can ask for help, I guess is what I'm saying. And you might have to make a few stops along the way uh, because it, it might not be as straightforward as you think it is. Um, sometimes people might think they're being discriminated against, but it's really something else. Uh, I know in the rental area, it's really kind of a landlord tenant issue. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have something to do with housing discrimination, but 
if you don't do this work, it's very easy for you not to know one versus another. So be sure that you seek assistance from experts who do this work uh, all along. And the final thing I would say in terms of, is it more difficult now? It absolutely is. And please don't make a quick decision that you'll regret because first time home buyers, especially, uh, you know, they get this feeling of, oh, well, I got to make a decision because the market's so hot and I'm going to miss out. And they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> and they end up um, not crossing, you know, not dotting their I's and crossing the T's. And, and it's a very expensive mistake to make. So in general, you know, um, fair housing is not something that you will be able to judge yourself. So get expert assistance. And if you're in the market looking for to purchase a home, realize that this is a difficult thing and you can get some advice around that too, uh, depending on your, your income level. We have a couple of organizations on Long Island uh, that help first time home buyers. Uh, so that's just something to keep in mind. And the new stay investigation, by the way, was all based on race. And I may have uh, neglected to say that uh, initially, because at this point, I think everybody knows about the Newsday investigation, might not be true. Um, and they found that 49% of the testers who were Black were discriminated against. That's almost half, 39 for the Latinx folks and 19% for Asians. So that's a devastating um, commentary on the market, the real estate um, professionals on their sector, you don't get those kinds of, uh, you know, percentages because you have one or two bad apples. No, I, Elaine, as always, a, a number of really good points. I, I think one point you made, which I think is a really maybe good point to close this discussion with is that, you know, it's okay as an individual New Yorker or tenant or home buyer or home seeker, not to know um, how to solve these problems. And, but I do think one thing you said, Elaine, is important. If something feels wrong or you have a question about something, ask, right? And you, know, you may not know who to ask, which may be part of the challenge, but you know, there are an array of resources in government and the nonprofit space um, that are out there to help you figure out these issues. And, you know, all of the, the folks on this panel are, are experts who've been doing this work for years. And um, one thing I think is clear from this discussion is that this is all very complicated and nuanced and challenging. Uh, and so um, it's okay not to know what to do. It's okay not to know how to solve these problems, but we do hope that you will reach out and you will ask and you will inquire if not for yourselves, you know, for other people, right? Because we know that this is a problem that will not go away unless we all kind of do all we can to, to deal with it and address it in all of its myriad of forms. I will also just say too, um, I know some of the questions um, were about kind of what additional steps um, or, or, or resources may exist in government. And um, although we didn't get to those questions right now, um, in a few minutes, we're gonna be, I'm gonna be joined by my colleagues uh, from some other state agencies who are gonna uh, talk about some additional resources. And so teaser for the next um, kind of upcoming part of the program. Um, so stay tuned for those parts. And then also I will just say, and I will thank, um, you know, Elaine, Aaron, and Alejandro, because they also did share with us um, in advance of this program an array of resources um, and, and, and tools uh, that may be helpful if you want to learn more about any of these topics or if you want to learn about some of the resources that might be available. And we will be sending out an email 
after this program with links and information for all of those resources. And so if you miss something, um, it likely will be covered in those um, links and, and those materials. And so you can expect to receive those. Um, I think we do um, have to turn on, on to the next part of the program. Um, but actually one other thing before saying that, um, you know, we did spend a lot of this discussion talking about race in the context of fair housing. And obviously, um, you know, for hopefully obvious reasons, Reasons. But you know, one thing that you know I would be remiss not to acknowledge is that the protections under New York state law, the protections under the Federal Fair Housing Act are not limited just to race. They cover an array of protected categories, age, sex, uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, which is I think a huge area where we see um, I think ongoing discrimination in the context of a denial of reasonable accommodations. And I know that you know, all of my colleagues here are also experts on those topics and we could probably have equally as long a discussion with any of those protected categories as well. Um, but just to make clear that, um, you know, this, although we're talking about race in this discussion, fair housing rights are not by no means limited just to race and they exist across an array of protected categories. And probably if you have, um, you know, a protected categories, it's probably covered under either federal or state or local law. And so please make sure to check that out. Um, so with all of those uh, comments out the way, I just wanted to thank Elaine, Aaron, and Alejandro for joining us for this part of the program. Um, this was a you know, a really important conversation. And, you know, as kind of like a legal nerd who just likes talking about these issues, I could probably spend um, multiple more hours having this conversation with all of you. Um, but uh, apparently I can't do that. I have to move on. So I just want to thank you all again for, for joining us this afternoon. And thank you for sharing um, your expertise with us um, this, this afternoon. So thank you again. Um, at this point, we're going to turn on to the next part of our program, and I'm going to turn the program over to one of my colleagues in state government and here at the Division of Human Rights, Ron Zaki, who is our Director of External Relations, and he's going to talk about a new exciting campaign that we are launching this month to help make sure all New Yorkers are educated about their fair housing rights. Ron? Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as we heard uh, during the panel discussion, um, there's, there's been much achieved, but we still have much more work to be done. And that is why we're so excited to talk about the important work DHR is doing in the coming weeks. We are launching the Journey of Fair Housing, a digital public awareness campaign that will include a newly revamped landing page um, on our website by going to dhr.ny.gov forward slash fair housing you'll find a hub of content, uh, including edu education materials, uh, like a fair housing guide. Also, an animated video series that we will have available weekly on YouTube and shared throughout our social media platforms that focuses on fair housing issues with a great introduction video we will give you a sneak peek of right now. Can we please share that video? We are going to take you on a journey of fair housing through New York State, where we have the strongest fair housing protections in the nation. Fair housing means your ability to live someplace that is not impacted by discrimination or harassment, and reasonable accommodations must be made for people with disabilities. If you believe that you have been discriminated against or denied a reasonable accommodation for your disability, you can file a complaint with the New York State Division of Human Rights. Thank you so much. Um, uh, I appreciate my team being able to share that. And um, in addition to videos like that, the campaign will include a robust social media campaign across all of our platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. You could find us by typing at NYS Human Rights, uh, that's the at symbol, or you could just search for New York State NYS Human Rights. On Facebook, we've also launched a fair housing chatbot, which also elevates our fair housing message through Facebook Messenger to those who engage with us. We hope that each of you will like, comment, and share our content so more New Yorkers will learn about their protections. I see in the question and answer thing that so many people ask what resources are available and what's out there. And that's why this campaign is so important. 
to help educate people about housing discrimination and also to let them know that the New York State Division of Human Rights is here as a resource to everyone. Um, we'd like to thank the New York State Office of General Services Media Team for working with us on developing this campaign. And um, a really special part of this campaign is the Source of Income Discrimination Tour. We are going to have regional events starting on April 8th um, that will cover, the first one covers north of New York City, which would be Hudson Valley, the capital region, and North Country, where we're going to have an educational presentation about source of income discrimination. We've partnered with human rights commissions from counties and cities, as well as housing rights organizations for that region. Um, after that event, the following week, we'll have one on Long Island. Uh, the week after that, we will have an event covering Western New York, Central New York, Southern Tier, and everything west of the Capital Region. And then the last event on April 29th will be the New York City Greater Metro Area. And we hope that anybody from across the state who wasn't able to make a previous one can join us in New York City for that event. Um, I know in the chat, we've put the information with the bit.ly's to uh, register. We'll be sending emails about that as well. Um, the importance of fair housing is so great. Um, our videos um, cover things ranging from uh, reasonable accommodations for people with a disability. Um, it also will cover source of income discrimination and other types of discrimination. So. Really, we hope you will stay tuned, and um, I'd be remiss without thanking our federal partners at HUD. Um, without their help, this campaign wouldn't have been possible. So um, we know that they'll be speaking in a little bit, but we just definitely wanted to extend our thanks. And we really look forward to you taking a journey of fair housing with us. Thank you. Back to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Ron, for sharing that uh, video and for all of those efforts. And, um, you know, again, as I mentioned, we will be um, making sharing links, including uh, links to uh, the video that was just shown and other resources following this program. You could also, if you don't already, follow us on YouTube or other social media platforms um, where some of that information may already be available. Yeah, at this Point, I wanted to um, turn the floor over to my colleague um, in, in, in government service, uh, Joanne Frey, who is the HUD Director of Enforcement for Region 2, which covers New York State. And you know, as Ron mentioned, and as you've heard, um, HUD is an incredibly important partner with DHR and with the state of New York around fair housing. And I have been personally really heartened to see the, the real commitment to aggressive fair housing, housing that we've seen, you know, both from the president, but also from Secretary Marsha Fudge, as well as from the other leadership um, at HUD. And so I'm sure Joanne will probably also mention this, but I just wanted to thank her and thank her colleagues for being critical partners in this effort. And with that, I will turn it over to Joanne uh, to give a few remarks. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, happy Fair Housing Month. Uh, you know, this year marks the 53rd anniversary of the Fair Housing Act. Um, every April, we celebrate the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which is the landmark civil rights law that was signed into law on April 11th, 1968. The act was enacted in response to the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King just days earlier on April 4th, 1968. The act itself was intended to bring an end to discrimination in housing. Now, I know as we just discussed, that obviously hasn't happened, but that was the initial intent of the act. And also the act was to eliminate the patterns of racial and ethnic segregation and economic disparities existing in neighborhoods and communities across the United States. And the original act was amended in 1974 to add sex as a protected class but the act was only last amended 33 years ago in 1988. And at that time, familial status and disability were finally added as protected classes. But you know, the act in 1968 was called a toothless tiger by the NAACP. 
And that was because it had a notoriously weak enforcement mechanism. So the 1988 amendments created a more robust enforcement mechanism. And that's the mechanism that we all have today. Each year HUD's Fair Housing uh, Month has a theme. So this year's theme is Fair Housing More Than Just Words. HUD is taking a meaningful actions this year to ensure that the country lives up to its promise to protect the public's fair housing rights. Um, as one very small symbol, um, HUD has a fair housing awareness ribbon with uh, seven colors, which symbolize the seven federally protected classes in the Fair Housing Act. Now I'll say that the state has many more protected classes than the federal government has. Anyway, this ribbon serves as a constant reminder of HUD's efforts to raise awareness of fair housing rights and responsibilities. And you know, progress has been made. However, this year's celebration occurs at a really, I would say a time of unprecedented challenge. The country is fighting to recover from a pandemic that's claimed the lives of more than half a million Americans. And the country is continuing to tackle tough systemic discrimination issues that continue, even though the Fair Housing Act has been the law of the land for over 50 years. That's why this year's Fair Housing Month theme, you know, Fair Housing More Than Just Words is, I think, so relevant and timely. The theme, which reflects the need for action, is also consistent with the approach the Biden administration is taking toward advancing equity in housing and the importance of increasing the public's awareness of their housing and civil rights. HUD is working hard to improve, I'm sorry, to implement the policy objectives of the Biden administration. And this includes achieving racial equity, supporting underserved communities and populations, addressing the history of discriminatory housing practices and policies, providing truly equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Promoting fair housing is central to HUD's mission. Um, President Biden, as you may know, signed an executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation on January 20th, 2021. The significance of this action is underscored by a number of housing discrimination studies, which indicate, indicate that same-sex couples and transgender persons in communities across the country experience demonstrably less favorable treatment than their straight and cisgender counterparts when seeking rental housing. Despite this reality, the department has been constrained in its efforts to address housing discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity by legal uncertainty about um, whether this was actually within HUD's reach. But the department has determined that based on not only executive order, but also the Supreme Court's decision in Bostock versus Clinton County, that HUD's Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity will investigate all jurisdictional complaints of discrimination because of gender identity and sexual orientation and will enforce the act, you know, take it to enforcement if we find that discrimination has occurred. Plus, the organizations and entities that receive grants through the department's HIP program has to carry out their funded activities to also prevent and combat discrimination because of sexual orientation and gender identity. And finally, um, the Fair Housing Office and its grantees reviewed all records of allegations of gender identity or sexual orientation received in the year before, so since January 20th, 2020, to determine if those claims were timely and jurisdictional, and if they were, then to move forward with investigating them. And HUD was the first federal agency to come forward with actions to further the purposes of this particular federal order. Um, so I want to thank you uh, for you know having me here today, and I wish you all a healthy and productive Fair Housing Month.
Thank you, Joanne, and thank you so much for joining us. And I wish we wish you the same as well. Um, I can imagine this is a busy month for you all at HUD. Um, and I, I did want to really underscore the last point you were talking about, um, the commitment to HUD uh, to ensuring protections um, robust protections for sexual orientation and gender identity. You know, um, fortunately in New York State, we've had those protections for some time, but you know, I think it is incredibly important for there to be alignment between federal protections and state protections. And obviously uh, the directive um, from President Biden and from HUD um, does that in the context of LGBTQ uh, individuals. And I think that's incredibly um, important and timely, you know, given you know, the, the ongoing challenges of discrimination that you referenced um, and that we know um, that community unfortunately continues to face. And I have to say that, again, I was really, really excited. Um, it was just a few days after the inauguration where I got the email from HUD saying, you know, they, they said all of you all who, who do this work around the country have to get on a conference call um, in two days to talk about this. And usually I have to admit, um, I get annoyed when you get last minute um, additions to your calendar invite, but that was one last minute um, invite that I was really excited to, to receive and really pleased to join because again, it, it does show the commitment that HUD uh, and this administration is taking to really ensuring protection for all, all, all people in this country and uh, obviously all New Yorkers. And, and we are really grateful um, for the partnership. And you know we're really excited, right? Because it's only been um, two or months or so since the, you know, the administration started and you all are already off to a really strong track off to a strong, strong start. And so we're really excited to see you know, what um, comes forward in the, in the upcoming days, weeks and months ahead. So thank you again, Joanne, for being with us today. The last part of our program, I want to um, bring to the discussion some of my colleagues from New York State government. Um, you know, one of the um, comments uh, and the questions we received was, what happened um, since the Newsday report? And Elaine mentioned, you know, some of the legislative changes and the governor has also enacted some reforms. But one of the things that he also, the governor also ordered, literally days after um, the Newsday story broke was for the Division of Human Rights to partner with our uh, colleagues in state government at the New York State Department of State and New York State Homes and Community Renewal, which is our housing development agency here in New York State to work together to address the issue of fair housing. And since that, um, that directive from the governor in November of 2019, we have been uh, conducting investigations uh, into some of the allegations that um, were um, alleged in the Newsday um, reporting um, because those um, investigations are ongoing. Um, unfortunately, I can't say more, but I will just note that you know, we have worked very closely with our colleagues uh, at the Department of State and at Homes of Community Renewal uh, to, to, um, to run down all of the allegations in that, in that reporting. Um, but at this point, I did want to bring to the conversation, as I said before, two of, two of, my, uh, two of my colleagues first, uh, Nadia uh, Salcedo, who is the Director of Fair and Equitable Housing Office at New York State Homes and Community Renewal, as well as Whitney Clark, who is the Deputy Secretary of State for Business Development at the New York State Department of State. I'm glad that Nadia and Whitney um, can join us this afternoon to talk about the great work that their agencies are doing as well. Um, and so I guess, why don't we start with you, Nadia, if you could talk about um, some of the efforts that HCR has been doing around advancing fair housing, um, that would be, I think, a really great place to start. Great, thank you, Jonathan. Um, and thank you everybody for joining on this Fair Housing Month event. Uh, one of the big things, and you heard it from Elaine earlier and, and the other presenters was about testing. You know, testing is a critical way to get at what is happening in the state to discern where discrimination is. And that's something that HCR is working on. We are in the final stages of signing contracts with different nonprofits throughout the state to fund fair housing testing to do this exact work um, that Elaine was talking about and that happened in the Newsday investigation. So um, that's one thing. We also have 
kind of going to what Alejandro was talking about with the lawsuit in Minnesota, I don't think that you will find the basis for that uh, here in New York as, as a base level. It's important to know that New York state human rights law uh, bars uh, housing providers, landlords from uh, inquiring about or even discussing uh, any prior arrests or criminal accusations that have been resolved in the applicant's favor, youthful offender adjudications, pending arrests with adjournments and contemplation of dismissal, and a variety of sealed convictions. So if a prospective applicant is even asked about these, the applicant can say no, right? He, they can just act like none of these ever happened. So those are, those are recent and strong um, protections that are important, but uh, New York State Homes and Community Renewal goes further in the housing stock that we um, finance specifically, and we require that each of our housing providers do an individualized assessment of those that have justice involvement histories, right? There's no automatic bar. You don't get to get a report and see a check mark for a criminal history or justice involvement history and say, okay, they're out. That can't happen. We have, they have to look into where they are in the community. How long was the conviction, was the conviction or, or arrest? Um, where um, was it dangerous to person or property, right? Though you can't get, get rejected for turnstile jumping, for example. So that's an area where HCR and New York State have really tried to, tried to be in a leadership position and, and get rid of unnecessary uh, barriers and discriminatory barriers to housing. And then our credit policy also, and I will include links to this in the chat, but our credit policy also goes far in saying you can't use a checkbox and say bad credit, no, no housing, right? That's another area that, had, that we believe has disparate impact on communities of color, on survivors of domestic violence, on veterans, on incarcerated populations and immigrants who haven't had uh, the opportunity to build up credit. So in our credit policy, um, there are several things, you know, if you can show you paid 12 months of uh, on-time rent, guess what? Landlord doesn't get to uh, pull the credit report because we believe that that stands in better than anything else. Landlord doesn't get to look at uh, medical debt and uh, student debt to turn someone away. If there's some domestic, some um, financial abuse or some negative impact to your credit because of domestic violence and, and other Violence Against Women Act protected uh, crimes, a landlord doesn't get to uh, count that in, in rejecting you. So there, there's a series of really strong protections that re we really believe kind of gets at what makes people rent worthy without counting very unfair discriminatory things against them. I will add more information about that in the link and um, Thanks again for joining. And we really do work day in and day out, me in the Fair and Equitable Housing Office with my colleagues, but also the agency to really try to be, uh, you know, to, to implement best practices and dismantle um, segregation and discrimination in the state. Take care, everybody. Thanks, thanks, Nadia. And you know, in addition to the links you will share in the chat, we'll also make sure those links are included in the follow-up email after this program for anyone who wants more information about any of the kind of um, programs or, or efforts that you discussed in more detail. Um, now I will turn um, it over to Whitney. And for those of you who are maybe wondering, why does the New York State Department of State have any role in this conversation? Um, something that you may not know, certainly I did not know before I joined uh, state government is that um, the New York State Department of State is responsible for the licensing and regulation of real estate professionals, including brokers and agents. And so they play a really important role in this space and around this around these topics. And so, you know, for those reasons, I'm really glad that we have been able to work with the Department of State, but also that we have Whitney here with us as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, on behalf of Secretary of State Rosanna Rosado, thank you for having us um, and helping us uh, kick off Fair Housing Month. 
Um, you're right. Uh, the New York State Department of State uh, issues occupational licenses to close to a million New Yorkers. Um, with particular relevance to fair housing, that includes the real estate professionals that are involved in most housing, housing transactions, such as real estate brokers, real estate salespeople, and real estate appraisers. Um, in addition to issuing licenses, uh, the Department of State has general enforcement authority. Our enforcement unit receives complaints from consumers and also conducts state initiated, initiated audits and inspections. When it, uh, violations are found, uh, the statutes authorize us to revoke or suspend a license, to issue a monetary fine, and to award restitution to an injured member of the public. So the Department of State um, really encourages anyone who believes that they've been a victim um, of discrimination to file a complaint with the Department of State. Uh, we're gonna be sharing some information on how you can do that. Um, but generally speaking, all of our complaint forms can be found on our website. And you can also obtain one by calling our uh, general customer service number, which is area code 518-474-4429. So last year, uh, Commissioner, you briefly alluded to it. Um, Governor Cuomo, um, under his leadership, we launched a historic partnership with the Division of Human Rights to uh, work closely together to investigate fair housing cases. Uh, so just this past year alone, uh, we worked closely with our DHR partners uh, to open a series of investigations tied to the allegations of discrimination by real estate professionals on Long Island. Of these investigations, uh, there are 80 of them, 24 uh, to date have resulted in the filing of formal charges against the licensees involved. And we anticipate filing additional charges in the, in the coming weeks. Also in the past year, the Department of State has adopted new regulations to better inform the public and the real estate professionals about fair housing. New regulations require real estate agents to provide affirmative fair housing disclosures to members of the public and to post information on their, on their websites, in their offices, and at open houses. And just last month, uh, getting into the appraisal realm a little bit, new rules were adopted to mandate and fa enhanced fair housing and fair lending education for real estate appraisers. So it's been a busy year. Uh, we look forward to continuing our work with all of you uh, to make fair housing reality for all New Yorkers. Thank you, Whitney, and thank you again for all of the great work that you and your colleagues at the Department of State have been doing, um, and you have been, you know, particularly on the enforcement side, um, really great partners, you know, with my, with, with our colleagues here at the Division of Human Rights as well. Um, and again, you know, we will make sure that um, the information that Whitney just mentioned um, will be available, um, some of it's available in the chat, but also we will make sure it's all available uh, in the email that will be sent out out after the program. And again, I know that um, I see that there were questions about whether this program has been recorded. Uh, the answer to that is it has been, and that also will be available. You can also find it on our uh, DHR YouTube channel, which clearly at this point, if you're not a member of, uh, a follower of, you should definitely do that. Um, and so I just wanted to close by thanking all of our panelists um, for being with us here today. And obviously thank all of you who have taken time out of your busy day to join us in this discussion as we kick off National Fair Housing Month. Um, you know, the State Division of Human Rights, we are here to help with issues of bias, discrimination, and harassment. And although we've talked a lot about housing today, um, our jurisdiction also includes employment, places of public accommodation, schools, and other areas other areas. And so we encourage any of you to, um, if you have been the unfortunate victim of discrimination or you believe you've been victimized by discrimination, to file a complaint with us. There's no cost to filing that complaint. And you can find more information about how to file by visiting us online at dhr.ny.gov or by calling our hotline at 1-888-392-3640. You know, providing voice and opportunity um, for people who have suffered discrimination or harassment is always incredibly important. But given the myriad of events we're dealing with right now, it's never been more important. And so 
I do encourage all of you uh, who need assistance or if know people who need assistance to reach out to us, to reach out to our colleagues in state government, in federal government, to your amazing dedicated advocates like Elaine, Aaron, and Alejandro, but just reach out to someone. And I hope that you all um, continue to stay safe um, during this um, ongoing pandemic um, and that you find an opportunity to continue to commemorate Fair Housing Month uh, over, the, over the month of April. So thank you again for joining us and I hope to see you again in another uh, event real soon. Thank you and take care.